always the best thing. All right. Good, good. How are you? It's been forever. You haven't changed at all. So as you can, well, I'll introduce myself in a second, but as you can tell, I'm at the baseball game. I think I emailed you. So I'm, I'm a little hard on hearing. I tried to go to the quietest spot possible, which is still kind of loud. So we, we, we will have to catch up post this. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. And I hope you have a nice time at the, the game. I know. Thank you. Um, so let's get this started. We'll likely have some folks joining. Let me um, uh, stream to LinkedIn real quick, Michael. Okay, let's go. We'll get, so we'll go to LinkedIn. Okay. Give it one sec. Okay. Just let me know when we're ready. I guess. I guess the Catherine, the Cardinals are in it as well. So at least, at least one member of your family is happy. Yeah, I'll have to tell Bill. He's actually headed to St. Louis tomorrow. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay, we're good. Okay, we're good. All right. Um, it's funny. I feel like I could use my uh, Princeton play-by-play -play announcer, like live from the corner of Carnegie and Ontario. Welcome to Cleveland Guardians playoff baseball. I mean, welcome to the Case Western Reserve University Entrepreneurship Speaker Series. Um, I'm Michael Goldberg. I'm our executive director. And when I made this plan to invite my friend Catherine Cousins, who's very today, I did not consider the Guardians being in the playoffs. So I'm quite pleased that they're in the playoffs, although I'm now here at the game. So um, I'm here to kick things off and welcome Catherine. Catherine and I are old friends, although we're not that old. Um, her husband, Bill, and I were friends from South Africa many years ago, and um, it's been really fun watching her career progress. Um, it's really fun. It's funny when we first started kind of emailing about this, uh, Catherine was like, hey, I'm not, this is an entrepreneurship speaker series. You know, she's running, you know, she's more on the corporate side of life, but um, so much about her journey to her current position. And also as we explore um, how corporates are innovating and coming up with new lines. So I'm, I'm thrilled that she's able to join today. Um, our sessions are always moderated by students. We're really thrilled. We like finding our students early, Catherine. So Philip Fernandez, who's a freshman or first year student, I guess is probably the vernacular we use, um, is moderating today's session. Philip is an entrepreneur, has like leaned in already. He's been on campus like two months and is already involved in a lot of our different activities. So I will turn it over to Philip. I am going to go on mute and um, off video as I make my way to my seat and look forward to connecting later. Um, Megan Kuhar, who's my friend and colleague from VIA, will be sort of running the show from us. So I want to thank um, Philip for moderating. Catherine, thank you for doing this. Um, and go Guardians and go Cardinals, which are Catherine's <laughs> husband's home team. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. I look forward to catching up soon. For sure. Thanks, everybody. Hi, Catherine. So I'm Philip. I'm here joined by Conch and what was that? Utah Bailey. Utah Bailey. And um, so, yeah, we're here from Case. And I'm really excited to speak to you guys. I don't know about you guys, but um, I know I've heard of Sperry. And although I don't have any Sperry shoes myself, my mom definitely has and my sister. So I think that that's really cool to see when companies kind of like have that, uh, that image. But um, yeah, we're really excited to speak with you. <clears throat> any of you guys have any like opening questions or things that you guys want to start with? No, we just want to hear more about uh, everything that's happened that you've been doing the past so many years and uh, yeah, just to know about everything that you've been doing in life. So a conscious question was, you wanted to hear about, um, I guess, what you're up to now and maybe what's going on with Sperry and how you're involved in, in all of that. Yeah, so I joined Sperry about a little over a year, uh, a little over a year ago in June of 2021. I had had almost 17 years at Timberland and VF Corp, which owns the North Face, Vans, uh, and some other brands, Smart Wool. So I spent a really long time in the footwear and apparel space, but it was time for change. And I took the role at Sperry. So I'm the president of Sperry. And I also oversee Keds and Pro Keds, which are smaller brands you guys may, may know as well. And so we are very much in turnaround mode. So it does rely on a lot of entrepreneurial scrappiness, um, which I'm sure you guys are, are very familiar with. 
a lot of scrappiness uh, to try to get these brands back on track. Both are long, long range, long history heritage brands in the U.S. and globally, but have kind of lost their way in the past uh, little while. And so the, the task that my team has is to try to figure out how to get back on track, but also to transform the business and, and brand from being sort of category focused to being consumer obsessed and lifestyle driven and purpose focused. So we are really making some big changes at the business level from an operational standpoint, but also at the brand level as we focus in on our target consumer and layer in this idea of a purpose, a brand purpose. Gotcha. So I'm hearing a lot about, I don't know why it's doing an error here. Um, can you still hear me all right? Yeah. Oh, awesome. So I'm hearing a lot about like brand values and I, I'm interested, like, I know you're talking about changing business operations and how you're trying to develop that brand um, with a lot of stuff that's going on in terms of like social media being a really big avenue for that. Do you guys see yourself kind of maybe expanding into that and, and what kind of role would you play in, in an operation like that? Certainly our consumer, we want to be where our consumer is and our consumer is on social media. So we are present across lots of different platforms. I'm sure you're very familiar with Instagrams. Um, obviously Facebook, TikTok, um, you name it, we're on connected TV. We're in lots of places where our consumer is. We try to reach out and make sure that we're communicating new products, brand direction, messaging, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty much everywhere our consumer is. Very cool. Um, at this time, if you guys have any questions or if anyone on the zoom wants to pose any questions, um, that would be a great time. Here you guys. English. Anyone on the video? Was it? No. no. All right. Um, well, I know you kind of mentioned your segue in, in 17 years in Tim's and VF. Um, so I guess that's more of like a corporate finance and corporate operations kind of role. How did you kind of decide to make that jump from kind of being in the background to being now like a really large face of the company? How is, how is that like? Yeah, so I, I've actually had a wide variety of roles at Timberland. I came from a strategy background. I'd been doing consulting prior to joining Timberland. And I joined Timberland before the acquisition by VF. So when I came in, I came into a strategy role. I ended up evolving it into more of a corporate development role. So you can think about um, investor relations, M&A, business development, in addition to strategy. We were acquired, and then I took on some business, op, you know, business line operational roles. So I had licensing, strategy, consumer shopper insights, corporate social responsibility. Really, I used to describe it as the land of misfit toys. But honestly, for me, it was about inventorying lots of different experiences on my way to becoming a general manager. I knew I wanted to lead a business, but I needed to pick up all these different pieces. Like how do you run a go-to-market calendar? How do you think about consumer insights and bring them into your product and your marketing? And how do you amplify them using your unique brand DNA? So for me, the, the 17 years at, at VF and Timberland were incredible, incredible learning. At the end of that period, sort of uh, 2018 to 2021, I ran three work safety brands that VF had acquired. So Kodiak, Terra, and, and Work Authority. Also fantastic uh, learning experience for me. It was a very different consumer target. So you think about people in the trades, construction, people who need heavy duty boots as part of their daily uniform. Again, great learning experience because these were about $100 million in revenue in total, but also in kind of a turnaround mode and needing some care and feeding, needing uh, to think through how do we expand gross margins? How do we manage our operating expenses to maximize profit? How do we think through all the levers within the PL um, so that we're being, making really smart decisions? So that all of those experiences prepared me to come to Sperry in, in June of 2021. And that it's just been a fantastic ride. I, I really enjoy the fix it part of my job, but I also really enjoy leading teams. So it's been super fun for me. I have an amazing, amazing team at Sperry, really talented folks who've done amazing different kinds of things at all the brands that you know, Nike, Converse, 
um, Crocs, Rockport, like you name the footwear, New Balance, you name the major global brand, we have that experience. And so bringing everyone together to play their A game, to me, is like the most fun part of the job. Very cool. Um, so I know when you're talking about, or um, I know that you had a, I thought it was a head raise on the Zoom. Yeah, if you if you had a question you want to go first, you can. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I know like kind of while you were talking, you mentioned a lot of like the scrappiness and being like the fix it kind of aspect of, of entrepreneurship. And I know a um, little bit of like a firsthand thing, like what that's like. Maybe do you have like a, a story of like what's like the, I don't know, the scrappiest thing that you've done to get something out or done in that kind of regard? Oh, I, I've got a really a great scrappy thing that's coming uh, that I think you guys will appreciate being uh, university students. So uh, maybe you know Head of the Charles. It's a, a crew race that brings together, uh, I think, 400 schools from the United States and also the UK to race against each other in crew. And I've actually never done crew, but Sperry um, decided like a month ago that we were going to have a booth there. And so it... From a retail operations perspective, you don't typically decide things in a month. <laughs> you got to pull in all the inventory. You got to figure out who's going to, uh, how we're going to get the inventory from the DC to the head of the Charles. We're actually, one of my uh, work uh, colleagues is going to be driving the truck from the office, from like the office office to the head of the Charles. We're all working shifts. I've got an iPad. I've gotten some retail training because I've never worked in a store before. And I'm so fired up. It's going to be. So if you guys are at Head of the Charles, come to the Sperry booth because I will be working and I will be <laughs> ready to fit you with footwear. And I'm super psyched for so many reasons. A, we pulled it together. It's an amazing target audience for us to sort of reposition Sperry. So it's not just your mom wearing Sperry that like you might consider wearing Sperry. So great opportunity, but I love my team. It's like, just roll up the sleeves. We're all going down. Everybody's getting trained. And at the same time, we're going to be really building empathy for the people who operate and, and staff our stores around the country and around the world, because it's hard. It's really, really hard what they do each and every day. And I want my team to sort of, and myself to experience that and feel that. And uh, I think it's going to bring us together as a team and it's going to be super fun. Awesome. I'm really happy to hear that. Hey, Jim. That's, uh, that's Jim walking in the room. I don't know if you guys have met each other, but he was also on the email list as well. Hello. How you doing? Okay, there we are. Hello. Yeah. So you guys should road trip to Head of the Charles next weekend. Uh, no, the weekend of the 22nd. And um, it'll be super fun. Head of the Charles. Where is, uh, where about is that? In Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, Massachusetts. I've got family. Yeah near there. So I, I will actually consider that. That would be awesome to come to that. I went my freshman or my first year of university. I went to Georgetown University and it was super fun, I have to say. But that was like, you know, in 1991 or something. Understood. Before you guys were born. <sighs> yes, that that is. <laughs> I, I'll ask a question kind of similar. You hey, just Megan, sort I of. Uh, talk, but I couldn't quite hear the, the front of that, the start of that. Oh, no worries. No worries. Um, I'm going to ask a question kind of you, you brought up something when you were just answering um, Phillips, you mentioned that um, Keds and Sperry have sort of like lost their way over the years. And I can kind of see like maybe that part of the reason is because they're very categorized with specific audiences. Like you mentioned, like maybe your mom wouldn't be the only one wearing Sperry, right? Is that kind of part of the reason why you think that they've been struggling or um is it, is it something else? And, and also how are you working on maybe expanding the audiences? I guess like this event would be one way, but is there any other kind of strategy that you all have been like thinking about that will help expand the audiences? Absolutely. So I, I think the root of the issue with both brands is kind of forgetting who they were and why they're special and getting really over distributed and chasing. So one of the things that when, when you sort of have to come back to basics, you know, get back to basics, get back to the core of the brand. I think Timberland went through this. We saw this, uh, you know, in the 2000s. And I think Timberland's done a great job coming out of that. And a lot of brands go through those sort of ups and downs. And I, Sperry and Keds are, are no different. And it's really about being very clear 
laser focused on who your target consumer is, understanding them at a very deep level, and then understanding what your brand means to them, um, bringing in some new talent as it relates to product and design and bring some more creativity, and then being very clear about your distribution footprint and trying to win with the winners and from a retail perspective. And then I think one, one thing that we've done over the last year is really elevate our what we call DTC, direct-to-consumer business. So those are the businesses that we own, our own e-com, and then our store footprint. And that's important for us as we, you know, I mentioned earlier, being laser focused on your consumer. Well, one way to do that is to really own that relationship with the consumer and understanding them at a deep, deep level. And you can do that when you, when you have a big chunk of your revenue coming from that direct consumer business. So then there are a whole bunch of operational things that we're doing around how we plan, how we forecast, how we buy, um, a lot of blocking and tackling that we need to do better. Um, we didn't have a lot of good systems supporting all of these actions across our value chain of bringing footwork to market. So it's real, it is top to bottom. <laughs> um, but it's been, for me, it's been very invigorating. It's because everybody's super motivated and committed. And then again, I, you know, the experience that we've brought from so many other brands combined with that institutional knowledge of folks who've been there a long time makes for an amazing combination of folks going after this, this, you know, this improvement plan and, and the growth plan that we have. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting too, especially like bringing in the other brand, like people from other brands that kind of have their own individual experience and, and maybe how they saw their ups and downs and what they helped, what they did to help get through those and everything. So yeah, thank you. And everybody's gone through it. It's really interesting. So my CFO came from Levi's and mm -hmm. I'm old enough to remember when Levi's was super hot in the eighties and then wasn't, and now it's hot again. So it's just, you know, things go in cycles, but there's also things you can do to drive those cycles. And it's important to, and, and improve your operations in so doing. So it, the level of experience on the team is, is awesome. Uh, on the topic of Levi's, I'm actually wearing some right now. So nice. For that. Yeah, awesome. Uh, in the chat here, I see a, a question from Mindy. Her question is, what does AI or analytics fit with getting to know your customer? Uh, it absolutely is very important. And we, uh, so uh, maybe you guys are aware, Sperry and Keds are part of a bigger portfolio of brands called Wolverine. And they own Merrill and Bates and Cat, Sweaty Betty, Saucony. So there's 14 brands in total. Sperry and Keds are two of the 14 brands. So what's really great about that is we can leverage the power of the portfolio to invest in things like AI and analytics and business intelligence and data and data mining analysts, um, a lot of data science. But I would say that that is very much at its early stages. I think Wolverine, I think it's fair to say Wolverine is a bit behind the curve when it comes to that. And we have a new CEO who started January of this year, and he comes from a real direct-to-consumer e-com digital background. And so that's been really good because he's helping us make that the great leap forward as it relates to AI and analytics. So I would say it's we recognize it's important. We're not there yet. We have a lot more work to do, but it will be critical in owning and understanding our consumer at a deeper level. Very awesome. Hey, Mindy, does that answer your question or maybe did you have a follow-up? It, it does. You know, I would say what advice would you offer students then who are interested in a career for a consumer product company, you know, um, maybe in the branding space for balancing? Because like you, you know, with you can tell by the gray hair, you know, I remember when Levi's were really cool and, and Ked's. Timberline boots were all the rage, you know, with the flannel shirts and the Levi jeans, you know, in the, in the, back in the eighties, um, at least in upstate New York, they were. So, so for students, how do you balance early in our career, or at least my career, you know, you were personal with the consumer, right? They weren't just a data set <laughs> and yet you need to balance because there's rich insights to be gained from, from data mining, right? Your consumer behaviors and creating a persona, but a persona is not 
a human being per se. And so what advice do you give the students for, for careers in that space for balancing that? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you're absolutely right about the fact that we're, we're all so much more than the persona, Google or whatever large company knows us by, um, I hope. And um, I feel confident. And so one of the things that we've done that's been pretty helpful, not only in understanding the consumer, but building that empathy for the consumer is we do a lot of grassroots events actually. So the AI is one thing, the analytics is one thing, but we do we do grassroots events like what we're doing at the head of the Charles. We did a big activation this summer in the Rockaways. Uh, we did, it was like a beach cleanup and we did a lot of stuff around our purpose as it relates to water because Sperry is, you know, very much born on the water. Very and I cool. think, that, yeah, like and we did New York City Water Day, like those things are important. I think for understanding a consumer, you get to meet your consumer. And then you also, you know, from an employee standpoint, like a staff associate standpoint, it bonds us so much and it's been so fun, to, you know, it makes work fun. And I, I really love the, the, the analog experiences, not just the digital experiences with, with my team, but again, like it does really make, it really makes those personas that you learn about through the data brings it to life in, in a much richer way. And I think you know, the students who are in university now have such an advantage over someone like me. I mean, we got email my senior year of college. <laughs> like, yep. You know, in 1995, we got email and it was, I didn't even know who to email. Like it was, we, right. no sense of, and you guys are digital natives, right? And so the, your skill sets are incredible but it's really also very important to layer in the humanity of it and not just rely on the digital side, um, which I think is cool because you can bring the creativity to the data and you can bring it to life through the human interactions. And at the end of the day, this is like, this is a people business, right? We're selling footwear and apparel to humans. And do you find that's true in your leadership role too, in, in managing a team, you know, you can have metrics, and data and insight, you know, along the way as you're looking at annual or quarterly or daily metrics as to where you're, you're tracking, um, but that alone is insufficient for, for leading a team. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, to me, you know, we've been so, we've all benefited from having these Zoom and other video conference platforms during the pandemic, which was obviously a very tough time. But I'm so happy to be back because I'm so happy to be back with people and, you know, interacting with them. And again, it's, it is a, I'm in a creative field and it's, it is important to be together to, to create a lot of times we can do a lot with metrics and we can really sort of hone in on the opportunities or the problem areas or things we need to solve for. But then I do find for me, at least the best moments are the moments when we're all together and either brainstorming or, you know, doing a workshop or whiteboard session or whatever. Uh, and I find that not only does it, you come up with sort of better ideas, but you also have that, you start to build that connective tissue, which I think is super important for a team. Nice. Well, I know uh, Jim really quickly had his hand raised, so I'm going to pass it over to him to ask a question. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Hey, Catherine. Uh, Jim Horowitz. I'm a junior electrical engineer, general interest in entrepreneurship. I run the Entrepreneurship Club. That's why I'm here. Um, yeah, you had mentioned earlier that, at least in the apparel industry, fads and fashion and pop culture play a really heavy role in your success as a brand. I'm curious from your perspective, to what extent do you feel a company can prepare for, you know, the new fashion trend? Is it luck? Is it skill? A mixture of both? Yeah, I think it's it's a great question. I, and it's probably, um, if I knew the exact answer, I would be a bazillion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I do think you, there, it is a combination, what we were saying earlier, a combination of the data and then also the art, so the art and the science. And so we do use a lot of trend forecasting uh, services. One of them is called WGSN, and that's a global service that sort of gives a lot of brands color palette, you know, um, it will tell you things about fashion trends as it relates to the um, 
skinny jeans versus not skinny jeans, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so those, those certainly influence us, but we don't, you know, we're not, it's not a cut paste kind of operation. So it is important to hire folks who have that merchandising background and I, which, you know, to be honest with you is not my strength, but I do have some great people on the team for whom it is a strength. Uh, I'm more of an analytical numbers person. So um, I have more of the science than the art in, in, in me, but it's, you know, recognizing where you have gaps and then hiring for those gaps. Jim, that uh, you have a follow-up to that? Or any questions beyond that? Or? I think that answers what I had. I'm sure I'll have a couple other questions, but I'll keep thinking. <laughs> um, well, I guess if there's no one else that has a question now, I actually have a question. So I know that you mentioned that you have a little bit of a background in consulting, and I know that this might be a little bit of a different kind of industry compared to that, but how would you say that you can apply some of that creative thinking and you're kind of applying those creative solutions into what you're doing now? Yeah, so consulting is a fantastic place to get a toolkit, and I'm sure you guys have been talked to about that. It's It really does give you important skills in terms of problem identification, solution set, uh, brainstorming, getting people focused in on what the problem is and what the range of solutions is, and then getting aligned around what, what solutions you want to go after designing them, implementing them, and then tracking them. So there's just a, that's just one example of how consulting has helped me in leading large complex projects, which effectively a business is just a series of large complex projects. And uh, for me, consulting, that structured problem solving skill set is super important. The communication, the deck building. I mean, I do so many presentations all the time and the consulting experience really prepared me for that. I'm, pre I'm presenting to the board. I'm presenting to a retail conference. I'm presenting to footwear news, you name it. And th thankfully uh, that that background was, was very helpful um, in, in preparing me for that. So certainly if anyone's thinking about consulting because they don't necessarily know what industry they want to go into, it's a, and, and frankly, even if you want to be an entrepreneur, you know, and you want to start your own thing, starting with consulting to get that toolkit is, is pretty, is a, is a good way to go. You know, you don't have to do consulting forever. The lifestyle is insane, but um, it is, you, you certainly learn a whole lot. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, um, Kanj here next to me, he's got a question. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm a Kanj, uh, I'm a junior studying data science and economics. And I know you mentioned a bit earlier about being a leader. And I'm just curious to know that in certain turbulent times, like right now, uh, when we're going to an economic crisis, where in the, when COVID happened, we were seeing a disruption with supply chain. And right now we're seeing um, chaos in the demand side of things where the bull whip effect is often coming into question and see a lot of uh, sell-offs and uh, a lot of companies are cutting down the costs. Inflation is going through the roof and like um, even with the economic policies that the government is implementing, we seem to be headed for a recession. And so as a leader, how would you navigate your company and lead through all those people and keep up morale and you know make sure everything stays good in the near four to six quarters and after that as well? Fantastic question. Uh, I, I certainly see the bullwhip effect in real time at, at, at my company and at many companies. You know, rewind to a year ago, we saw nothing but green lights ahead. And if we could only get inventory, we would be able to drive the growth of the business. So everybody over ordered and over planned. Uh, so you see, even Nike. Yes, uh, this week, um, earlier this week, reported that inventories are up 70%. I mean, if, if the best in class company in the space missed the signals, I think that that tells you something. So, and that's what you were describing that, that bull whip effect. We all <laughs> tried to eat more than we could digest. So with respect to the team, for me, the biggest focus is on cash management. And I think this would make sense in any entrepreneurial venture 
you always have to think about your, your use of cash and how you're managing your cash. And so that's your highest, uh, your highest, generally your highest use of cash is inventory. So we're thinking about inventory all the time. Um, it's, it will be a very good time to be a consumer <laughs> over the next while, because you're going to see a, a very promotional environment, uh, for the next six to nine, nine, maybe even 12 months. So for, for us, it's bringing, for me, I always think that let's bring everyone together, be as transparent as possible through data. This is what we've got. This is what, this is what the problem, the scale of the problem is as it relates to inventory. How are we going to come together and make decisions and then move through that over time and, you know, holding people accountable by setting clear targets and, um, and using metrics to hold people accountable. But it's important on the human side of that is to remember we all got here together. So there's no use in pathologizing anyone or even frankly assigning blame. Understand the root cause of the issue, but it doesn't really matter who was at fault per se. You can deal with that later once you get through the, the crisis. But I think as it relates to the, the team morale, what I, you know, it's been, it's retail has been really, really tough. So what I try to do is think through, here's our project plan or here's our plan to work through our challenge. Everyone's working together, we're holding each other accountable and we're gonna make progress. At the same time, there are some good things that are happening. So let's not forget to identify those and talk to those and highlight those, those green shoots. So there's small wins. Make sure that you celebrate those as well uh, and, and keep everyone focused on the opportunity. I'm sure you guys talk a lot about growth mindset, but growth mindset is easy to do when you're growing. Growth mindset is a lot harder to do when you're in crisis. And that I think, you know, it really shows folks true colors if they can stay realistic and focused on the problem, but also see the opportunity for the future. And, and I think that's a really important thing because it does help keep people, you know, positive in a tough time, but realistic on what we need to do. So I, I, I like to have a very balanced approach. I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish. I don't know if you guys get that reference, but I don't want to be overly positive. <laughs> Thank you, Mindy. Um, I don't want to be overly positive and fake and false. But at the same time, it, you know, if we're all if we're all down all the time, that's going to get really old really fast. And this is a it's a marathon. You know, we all got to we got to. Oh, and the, the last thing I would say is as it relates to um, team morale, it's super important people take time off to do the things that they need to do to stay mentally healthy, physically healthy, whether that's exercise or spending time with loved ones or whatever. This is going to, it's going to take us a year to get through this. And I need people to take care of themselves, you know, so that's how I kind of think about it. Awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, it makes sense a lot of people are going to value like things that are actually more valuable like as you mentioned a growth mindset is very crucial but i think things that are more valuable like more value focused will be prioritized and i think that's something um, everybody should be looking forward to i guess yeah uh we've got a question here down at the end of the table right. uh, do you want to just make sure you speak up or if you want to come over here and mute the thing um so my question is like a little i don't know if how you take it considering you said you just became president of spirit for like how many years has it been now like roughly uh a year or two or something like that 15 months right 15 months so like roughly like a whole year um so as far as, as everybody's concerned, like Sperry has been in existence for like decades. Like I think it's like over 80 years old, right? And according to research, it says that it's made of like natural leather, like the shoes are like natural leather shoes, right? So my question, what, sorry, correct me. Okay. Yeah, they're not, they're, um, I mean, leather, is a byproduct of uh, the meat production industry. So, you know, they come, uh, leather obviously comes from cows, but it, we don't, 
slaughter cows for the leather. We take the leather once cows are slaughtered for the beef. Um, so it's then tanned and used in footwear, but also uh, automobile seats and other other products. Uh, but it is we we use something called light leather, low impact to the environment leather. Spare is very very focused on water, and it uses quite it uses natural um, chemicals to tan the leather, which just means treat it so that it looks like footwear leather. And then we also do use way less water than most uh, footwear companies do in um, in getting in prepping the leather for use in producing our shoes. Right. Yeah. I guess my question was going to be um, since, like, as you said, like, in order to get leather, it's like a byproduct of like you know the meat industry. Mm -hmm. um, as a global brand, as as big as Sperry, like, how just how like an estimation just how do you deal with the demand? Like, how do you, how do you serve the demand? Like, it's kind of like, uh, because it's such a high in demand uh, shoe brand, uh, because of its benefits, it's sort of like, how do you maximize responding to consumers' demand while at the same time, because uh, it's not just very that relies on like five products of like, you know, like the meat industry. So my, my issue is, do you ever run out of, you know, Materials since right now a lot of people are becoming more aware of like the environmental impact that the meat industry is you know is doing. A lot of people are like turning more into like be, like get, they're being vegetarian or vegan. So how does Sperry kind of like appeal to such customers who decided because of what the meat industry is doing to um to the environment that they want to be vegetarian or vegan? Like, does very have some sort of like a product that kind of appeals to them because they want to completely uh, be off uh, any byproduct that's in the meat industry because of its environmental impact? Great but, question. Yeah, great question. So uh, a couple, I would say a couple of things. One, we have a pretty focused yes. innovation. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We have a pretty focused innovation engine within our product team. And so we've been working on synthetic leathers as well as mushroom leather. So we're trying to think through, and by leather, it just means it approximates the look and feel of regular leather, but it's made from mushrooms. Um, we've also looked at using scrap leather that's been reground down so when you take footwear product back you can regrind the leather and you can make something new some sort of new leather reconstituted leather uh, out of it so we're looking at all of those different ways on the leather side but then we also have a line we call sea cycled and so by 2025 50 percent of the styles that we make are going to be uh, are going to meet the sea cycled standard which is we're using recycled PET, which is just recycled water bottles and other plastics that are reclaimed from the ocean, ground up into thread, and uh, the, then it produces, a, we can turn it into canvas. So you won't see that in a leather looking product, but you could see that in, uh, we have a lot of different canvas sneakers and we have canvas looking boat shoes so that that are considered sea cycled and they use also uh reground rubber so recycled rubber and other things to really trying to lean into that sustainability side i talked earlier about our purpose platform which has two sides to it one side we call all for water and the other side we call water for all the all for water side is about the sustainability. So all the sea cycled product that I was just talking about, all the work we're doing to reduce how much water we use in the production of our footwear, all the plastics we're trying to reclaim from the ocean, which is the world's actual biggest playground. So we really feel committed as a, a water-based brand. We feel very committed to keeping that clean. Um, so that's the all for water side. On the water for all side, what we have learned over the past, I would say like five years, really, the team has been on this learning journey about who has historically had access to water in the United States, in, 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 in all over the world, but especially in the United States, like who has not been able to enjoy our 
beaches and lakes and waterways because of discrimination and other things. So we've been working with a, uh, a media entrepreneur who started a company called Clayma. And you guys can see these videos on, uh, on, on YouTube um, and on our social media on sperry.com um, as well. But it's basically what he's doing is trying to highlight entrepreneurs of color who are working in, in water, whether it's fishing, they've got a fishing business that they've started, they've got a surf nonprofit that they started where they're trying to get more people of color, color to enjoy the oceans and the waves, or they're teaching people of color who are in, in cities how to swim because they can't always, they, you know, they don't, might not have access to swimming lessons. So we're, we're trying to think about water holistically from a sustainability side, but also an access side, because I live, I live in Newburyport, Massachusetts, which is right, the town is right on the water. And I can tell you every day when I drive home and I, I drive past the water to get to my house and it's just like, ah, I just, I exhale. It's just, everyone can feel that recharge feeling when they're on that water and that calm and the Zen. And it's also so much fun. So we want to make sure that if you, if Sperry can have a positive impact on the world, it's got to be around this notion of water. This is more sustainable and cleaner ocean way, oceans and lakes and, and waterways, but then making sure that more people have access to enjoy those, those moments. Right. Uh, interesting. I guess like a follow-up question would be, you talked about like how spirit sort of like will, by 2025, I think, we said it will like try our uh, recycle all like the plastic water bottles that like trapped in the ocean and sort of like, you know, um, make the environment like kind of like the ocean like a better place and stuff. So I guess more on like, a product like a a product level like uh, what measures does Sperry have in place to sort of like recycle the already bought shoes say maybe they don't fit anymore or they've been worn out is there like a program or just a sort of measure that Sperry does to sort of like recycle back the shoes that people no longer want or wish to have like recycle them back and sort of like reuse them again to make products um, again from the recycled stuff? Like, what does it do with that? It's, it's a great question. It, working on our plan for spring of 23. So I will say, stay tuned, look out for that because we are working on that. We think it's really important and we can very easily use the materials from previously owned footwear in future footwear, you know, whether, whether it's the outsole, which is the bottom of a shoe that can be reground up. It might not have the same color properties, but it can be something different and new. So it's not, it's really every part of the, of the shoe can be reused and we are working hard on a plan to bring that to life. So 2023. <laughs> All right. Well, I know that it's um, getting near that end of that time. So I think I'm going to pass it on to Megan so that she can uh, kind of make some closing remarks. And But um, overall, we were really glad that we got to have this time and, and ask you these questions. It was really insightful. And it's clear to see that you're really passionate and excited about what you're doing. So that's always like really refreshing to see. Awesome. That's great. So thank you so much, Catherine. This was awesome. And we really appreciate your time. And, um, you know, hopefully everyone will start following all of the accounts on their favorite social media platforms and getting engaged. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next. And um, yeah, we just really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. It's, it's really awesome to be here. I love talking about Sperry and I love talking about business. You guys had fantastic questions. Um, tough questions, but I wouldn't expect anything less. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And I wish you guys all the best. And uh, yeah, check out Sperry. Awesome. Likewise, Catherine. Thank you so much for having us. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.